My name's Ian Spillman. I'm from a little town in California. All my life, I've been in the outdoors and loved every minute of it. Recently, that love has taken me farther and farther from home and on a search to find the most pristine and remote places on Earth. New Zealand was the next step. As an American, you see a little Lord of the Rings, hear some word of mouth, and get some fantastic marketing from New Zealand itself, and you're ready to go. On my first trip here, I did everything a good tourist is supposed to do. New Zealand lived up to all my expectations, and I came away understanding that this place really was the mythical, untarnished land I was promised. Then, pulled back by its ever-present draw, it was time for a much longer stay. I decided to come live here, in Christchurch. I was back in paradise. But I learned quickly that there are some things the tourist just never hears. But in reality, the purity of New Zealand's fresh water is far from 100%. Its quality has been in decline for decades. More than 60% of monitored rivers are unsafe to swim in. In the ongoing fight between Greenpeace and the dairy industry over the state of Alberta, Greenpeace big challenge is water and our capacity to gather food from the coastlines, the inland, and on the waterways. If we don't look after that, our vision's like that. Hello. Hello. Hey, Dad. Hey, there he is. I'm coming. Come on. You look like a woolly New Zealander. <laughs> That's a look. It's summer there, though, right? Uh, yeah, but you never know with the weather here. Yeah. An island out in the middle of the ocean. How's that? What? I'm talking about New Zealand. Oh, can nice. you see it? It says New Zealand. <laughs> yeah, I see it. You know, I still don't say Kiwi, even though you said it was okay. <laughs> it's not derogatory. It's okay. <laughs> That's a cute bird. How's, uh, how's all the, um, you know, the, the documentary filmmaking going? Last time I talked to you, you seemed a little stressed out. Yeah, it's just tricky trying to get into it uh, in the beginning. It's such a big, complicated subject. A really big part of it is just kind of my disillusionment with, with what New Zealand really is. You know, I had this tourist perspective of, of New Zealand as this perfect, green, pristine place. You know, when you come and visit, when I came and visited, um, you see all the very best spots and, and you see these beautiful, pristine, untouched lakes and mountains. And, and then, yeah, now living here, you, you just see a different perspective and you hear things from the people that you didn't hear in the, in the tourist uh, route. I, I hope that when you come to visit it, it, that you're not disappointed or anything, like it's a completely different place than what you saw decades ago. I knew there was someone out there I could talk to about all this. I contacted one of the most outspoken figures in water quality issues, 
labeled an extremist by some, freshwater ecologist Dr. Mike Joy. Yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of things going on with New Zealand rivers, but I, I think I could just narrow it down to two really big ones, sediment and nutrients. So sediment, you look around New Zealand, you see all these rolling green hillsides. Well, they were all covered in forest, but we wiped all the trees off the landscape here. And so we have huge issues with sedimentation. Some of the highest sedimentation rates in rivers ever recorded in the world are on the east coast of the North Island of New Zealand. You get this effect of smothering habitat that happens from sediment. Native fish, they spend a lot of time in what we call the interstitial spaces between rocks and boulders and rivers. When fine sediment fills in all those gaps, and they don't have anywhere to live anymore. But the, the other biggie that's from agriculture, I mean, that, most of that clearance was for agriculture, but for modern agriculture, intensive agriculture, it's, it's nutrients and mainly nitrogen for our rivers that's the problem. New Zealand is a farming country. Through the length of both the North and South Islands stretch the sheep and dairy farms. Farms that have acquired background to New Zealand's spectacular scenery. Farms that are the very lifeblood of the country's prosperity. To New Zealand, farming is the biggest and most important industry. 80% of all its exports come from the land. Just to give it a little bit of history, Dairy farming was based around the nitrogen being fixed by plants. The majority of the grasses on the paddock were clovers and they can fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. This was said by many experts to be our big advantage globally is that we didn't use an industrial fossil fuel process to fertilise our land. And then around the 80s there was oil and gas discovered off the coast here and the deal was they wouldn't get it out unless we took it and so they had this take or pay scheme. The government of the day had to think up with all of these ways of using up all of this gas. So they built this huge plant to make urea fertilizer from natural gas. And so then it was pretty much a huge industrialization of farming that happened over the next couple of decades. And then the issue is, you put the nitrogen fertiliser on, it grows grass, the cows eat the grass, a little bit of the nitrogen goes out in the milk, but most of it goes out in urine. And, and if anyone's seen a cow pee, they'll know a, this is big gush volume of liquid that hits the ground in a very small area, and it's way too much nitrogen for that small area of plants to take up. And most of it just goes down through the soil. Canterbury's a fantastic example of it, where it's just gravel, so it just goes whoosh, straight out of the system, down into groundwater and then up into rivers or cross into rivers. So you get aquifers filling up with nitrogen and rivers filling up with nitrogen. The nitrogen then, in the same way that it grows grass in the paddock, it grows algae in the river. So you get a big buildup of algae, which smothers the bed, so they, they lose habitat. But worse than that, the algae uses up oxygen. And so you start getting big fluctuations in oxygen, and that's the killer. So it's kind of long-winded, but the, the farms are leaky. They leak nutrients because you're pouring too much on, there's no cost on it. It's cheap because we're not paying the true cost of it. Massive increase in the number of cows, 1,000% increase in, in nitrogen use, which is a massive increase in the rivers as well. When I was young, you'd go to the rivers and the rivers were all clean and you swam in any rivers and now you go and it's, it's just terrific, the, the destruction that's been done. And it's the growth, the growth in it, it just, it was just stony rivers with, that were really pleasant. Everybody went there every Sunday, you'd go out to the river for a, a picnic and now it's just not the same. <laughs> New Zealand is a beautiful country. When you go up in the mountains, it's, it's at crystal, but when we start to come out of the mountains, I'm wondering how, how crystal our environment is. The toxic stuff is another separate issue, which is cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria is a, a, like a black algal mat. So it's, it's sort of a, a, like a black hairy film that coats a rock. And uh, normally a more healthy algal color would be a, either a green or a brown but in this case the black mats are, are really nasty and uh, they, they're actually a neurotoxin in a lot of cases. That's why they, they can be quite harmful to both animals and also humans. Algaes do occur naturally in the environment and there are certain species that feed on those algae and it it's really becomes an issue when you have too much of it. And so for example Lake Forsyth, uh, Lake Waiwera, which is near 
Lake Ellesmere, that's had some really big algal blooms in the last few years and it's, it's got very toxic. In fact, it killed uh, 30 sheep that had drunk from the lake. My name's Scott Pearson and uh, I work for North Canterbury Fish and Game Council. Our key role is to protect the sports fishery and uh, game bird habitat. And my focus is particularly around water quality and, and water quantity issues, and particularly as regulated under the Resource Management Act. What we've found in, in recent times is that uh, fish and game has had to sort of, I guess, rise above just its statutory role to, in some ways, a, a surrogate environmental protection agency. One of our key roles is advocacy, and so we're not afraid to make some noise when we see bad things happening or things that we'd like to improve. We're finding in a lot of the lowland streams here in Canterbury that habitat quality has gone down a lot, particularly the last 25 years. And what we're seeing there is without that good habitat, the rivers can't and, and the lakes can't sustain such healthy populations of fish. Well, New Zealand's pretty unique in terms of its environment. It's such an isolated country, surrounded by oceans. It evolved in terms of its species and biodiversity completely separately from the rest of the world. So a lot of our species here are quite vulnerable to predators and also to invasive weeds and other, other species that you'd find in other parts of the world. So I guess it's unique, but it's also delicate in that sense. So if you were to sort of try and say, well, who in terms of the land users is having the biggest impact on the environment, uh, we would tend to look at the most intensive uh, agricultural practices. So particularly dairy farming, we've found is very intensive. You get very heavy stock. They eat a lot of grass and so they're producing a lot of milk. So they, they actually end up producing a lot of urine and, and uh, fecal matter as well. So there's various issues from that intensification all in one spot. Dairy farming does well on very gravelly soils. On Canterbury, for example, it's almost like hydroponic farming, that the more fertiliser you put onto these leaky soils, the faster the grass grows. And so they can put a lot of cattle on, but the downside of that is that a lot of those contaminants flow straight down into the groundwater system and out into the rivers. So there was clearly a problem. And with every problem, there are people trying to fix it. I wanted to find the activist of all activists. And I think I did. Hello? Hey Sam, how's it going? Hey, are you very... I can hardly hear you. Um, how's that? Is that better? A wee better. I'll just put my thing in the other ear. Hey listen, um, i got to be in town Thursday. You wouldn't be free around lunchtime, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, that works. Well, my name is Sam, Sam Mann, it's an Irish name. In Ireland I think they call it Mahon, but we don't worry about that because we're interested in content, aren't we? Um, I don't know how to describe myself. When I was at art school, uh, one art lecturer referred to me as a folk artist. I guess that's because I was painting what I saw around me, and what I saw around me were hills and rivers and the things I loved, so I painted the things I loved. I can't paint those things now because a lot of them have been taken away. So maybe I'm not a folk artist anymore, but a, a, an angry fucker. Is that, is that fucking anyway? Famous North Canterbury Capo. <laughs> I first came out to Waikari, um, really on a dare, somebody, I'd always wanted to live in the country by myself. So I moved out here and it was just like I'd come home again because I was brought up in this kind of country. When I was a kid, we lived out of town. We had hills just like these. And the beauty of, of this place, in particular, it's a gateway to the hills. There's a, the lakes up there, the mountains. But the old flower mill was perfect for me because no one wanted it. And I've always lived on what nobody else wants. So uh, as a studio for sculpting and for writing, it's perfect. And life here, you'd say, was pretty well as good as it got. When the day was sunny, like now I'd go down to the river, when it was raining I'd paint. But the beauty of going down to the river now has been diminished a little bit because, of course, you go to the river and you know the poison's floating through the water. You want to try and retrieve that and, and get the river back so that our kids can have the same experiences that I had in 1978 when I first came here and go to a river which was in perfect condition. Our grandfathers passed it to our fathers, our fathers passed it down to us. What right have we got then to pass those rivers down to our children full of cow shit? So, 
my partner once said, it's, it's like, a, like a church to us. It's our spiritual center when we go to the river. It makes you feel good. And uh, I've tried to present that argument to Mayor Winton Daly. I said, look, it's our church. You have your church. It's a building down the road. You sit there in that church and you speak to somebody I can't see. And he tells you that life's good and you're doing a good job. When we're at the river, we can't see what's around us, but we feel good. So it's the same thing. We wouldn't tear your church down. And you're quite happy to rip ours apart. So we fight. We pledge that we will faithfully and impartially use our skills, wisdom and judgment throughout the discussion and deliberations ahead of us today in order to make responsible and appropriate decisions for the benefit of the Hiranui district at large. We commit individually and as council to the principles of integrity and respect and to upholding the values that we believe distinguish and enrich our district. Dear Winton, I first met you on a riverbed, just like this. We were pulling out dead cars and mattresses, burying household detritus and pig offal, and afterwards, tired, we passed around cups of billy tea and watched the children as they played in the clean, clear water where the afternoon sun sparked and sang. It was a special place then. It's where the salmon came to spawn. It's where Danny buried the placenta of his firstborn. It's where the school kids would come to slip through the willows, seeking out the summer swimming holes. It's all gone now, of course. The Waitoe, the Waitoe River was turned to dust when the pumps went down and no one goes there anymore. It seems to me there's no shame in this community anymore. We either do or do not invest money in the Harano Water Project as a gesture of support for farming, which is the biggest industry in our district. Describing HWP, the Harano Water Project, it's another private irrigation scheme. These schemes are designed for intensive agriculture. Whenever agriculture becomes intensive, it pollutes. In the 30 years I've lived in the country, we've never had problems with the water. We've had agriculture happening all around us, and the water's always been clean because it hasn't been intensive. Now, by taking water from the rivers and putting it onto the land in such a way that you can grow anything on stones, we've got a problem. OK, and I repeat the Mayor's uh, welcome. Um, and um, just to note that this issue um, has, has been controversial, remains controversial. Um, it's my intention to um, uh, allow council, the councillors that remain, uh, to debate in an orderly fashion. So I'd ask um, your indulgence to, to, to allow me to maintain all this. So basically what happened is, is about a year ago, the Hiranui Water Project organisation went to the Hiranui District Council and said, oh, you should invest, it'll be a great thing. And then about six months ago, a district plan came out where the Hiranui District Council proposed to invest half a million dollars uh, in the Hiranui Water Project. What this whole process has done is highlighted some, some real issues around the community. It's, it's torn a community apart. Council acknowledges that it read and considered all the written submissions received and the potential purchase of the Hiranui Water Project shares and listened to oral submissions on the 19th, 17th and 19th of April 2018. The well, submission processes are like lightning rods for your energy. You make your submission, you think you've changed something. You walk away, you wipe your hands, and you think things will change. So I've come to the end of the submissions process and, and, and identified some other information that's been received since the submission process. And we have on the board a list of, of um, things that uh, we need now to consolidate into perhaps a more succinct and user-friendly list of issues. Councillor Davidson is a long-serving councillor and has a lot of experience, but he was also, he was on the board of the Amuri Irrigation Company. He was a farmer, he knows and loves irrigation. We felt that that really um, indicated a very real bias, that he had made a decision before the process. We requested that Councillor Davison be removed from the process. That didn't fly. Councillor was decided that he was okay in that position and yeah, that's fine, that's, that's democracy, that's the way things work. I have to say that my reputation is important. I'm dismayed. My position was challenged, and I'm pleased that I had the support of my fellow councillors. It's really hard because everyone is so entrenched. 
and feel so threatened. Everyone was so entrenched. But where was the other trench? Who were all these people that were supporting something that seemed so harmful to the rivers? And why weren't they at this meeting? Was I biased in thinking they were wrong? My name is George McLean and um, I'm a farmer and um, I've lived here most of my life. I'm Mary Ann McLean, obviously George's wife. We've been married for 30 years, so we've lived here for that long. This farm is uh, sheep and beef. Um, we have dairy support and we raise beef calves. The land here we live on is generally rolling to quite steep country. It's been in George's family for quite a period of years and his family have lived in the Omaha district probably for 90 plus years. The last four years we have struggled with the low dairy payout and the, it was probably a record drought we had here. Something that would send us into new endeavours is irrigation. We um, make the best use of what we've got available just at the moment. Um, but we're always on the lookout. We'd do anything to, you know, be profitable really. Sorry, in they're especially crazy this year. <laughs> they settle down once they um, you know, get used to being on their own and um, they'll actually be a lot better off without their mum because they're competing for all the nice feed, the clover and things. We're trying so much harder to make money. It's a lot harder to make money than perhaps it was back then. Wool is such a fantastic product, but it's worth not a lot, great deal of money. It's mainly synthetics. They've become so big and so powerful, they can produce them so cheaply, really. That's been the main demise of wool. Uh, the Hiranui Water Project has been a long time coming. It's just been put together to help us in North Canterbury get through these dry periods which seem to be getting more and more prevalent um, and give us the opportunity to do something outside what has traditionally been just sheep and beef country. You know we can see for the future generations that it could be a really good thing for the area with the droughts that we've had recently it was just so hard both um, emotionally and um, financially. The climate's definitely getting more variable hopefully it if this irrigation comes through that'll mean that we'll be able to stand on our own two feet. More so I think it's going to be important for the community as a whole. It's going to create employment during the build phase. It'll create ongoing employment as more farms employ more people. There could be specialist crops being grown, there could be more grapes going in. People tend to forget how valuable and important irrigation is. Apparently 40% of the world's population is fed from irrigated land. As far as Hiranui District Council investing in the scheme, it would be a good use of their money to put into a scheme that's going to create employment and income for this district. There's, there's always arguments against irrigation, I suppose, in that it definitely has an impact on water quality. We're in a red zone here, so the Wiper River has a naturally high phosphate level and any increase in nitrogen can have a detrimental effect on the river so we have to be very careful that what we grow and what we run on the soils doesn't end up adversely affecting the river. The more money we can make on our farms the more we're likely to look after our environment. That's the way I look at it. They often say that you can't be green unless you're in the black. If you're in the red all the time and losing money, well, you're not going to be investing in fencing off waterways and planting, re regenerating native uh, bush. We've seen a bigger change between the urban and rural communities. I think in the past all urban people had a relative or a family that they enjoyed going to visit and stay on the farm and saw what farmers did so they got a good understanding of what was happening on a farm. Whereas sadly now there are not so many people able to come and stay on farms. You feel a bit attacked as a farmer quite often on social media 
you will have people making very negative, uninformed comments on what we are doing on the land, and it can be quite soul destroying at times. I saw a headline on the television news the other day and it said uh, New Zealand's biggest polluter and it had a photo of a dairy farm behind the presenter. Now New Zealand's biggest polluter could well be all the cars on the road, it was just as easy to have uh, a picture of that or a picture of all the raw sewage that gets pumped into Auckland Harbour every time there's a major rain event up there so we need to be a bit more conscious of running farmers down for things that often they are not doing. I admit that there is a small percentage of people that probably aren't towing the line, but th that's the same in any industry. Why do you think uh, so many New Zealanders at the moment, especially urban people, are so against uh, the development of new irrigation schemes? I don't think they're well, they're dumb if they're against irrigation schemes per se. What they visualise that every irrigation scheme is a scheme that's going to pollute the countryside, which is absolutely wrong. It's the model of farming that's doing the damage. Yeah, I'm John McCaskey. I live in Waipuro, the farm Wicker Plains, which my father bought in 1935. I've been here 80 years plus. From the time I was big enough to stand up, I was big enough to hold a bottle and feed a pet lamb. My interest in irrigation was that uh, my summertime bath in the home laundry was in the Wicker Creek. I think the aim of every farmer was to try and make two blades of grass grow where one grew before. So 1970s, early 70s, I applied to get a water right out of the Wicker Creek and I pumped water from just up here. I put the plough in the ground and went a mile down the flat here and the water followed me down to the dam that was built in front of the homestead. Bob Crowder from Lincoln had told us we had a California climate and wiper. You can grow tomatoes, field tomatoes. On that two acres in front of the homestead, alongside the little dam I built, we had 33 tonnes of tomatoes off two acres, which gives you an idea of the potential of just a wee bit of water. It's only for the growing season, which is how this is designed. That's gone by now because the irrigators with the dairy system that we've got want the water to make their grass grow all year, which is a totally different thing to family farm. And my meat and wool statistics I've got from way back 1964, there were 120,000 family sheep and beef farms. There were 60,000 dairy farms. They were all family farms. Now, in both cases, there's less than 20,000. And all those farms have become lifestyle blocks and further back have become corporates. Okay, we're at the top of the Star and Garter Hill in Waikari. And looking back at Tako, which is the shallow ice cream away up there. If you sweep left from that, between the two trees, across the Waikari Valley. Over the top of that hill is Lake Sumner. The big answer for this area is to harness the storage, not the rivers. Raise the water of that lake four metres, you lose a bit of bush, but then everything moves up above the waterline again as time goes by. It did it at Manapuri, it did it at Tiana, it's done it at all the lakes down south, which are tourist attractions. It would be generating power all winter as it comes down the pipeline to work any pumps that had to pump water over a hill and it would be a, a benefit to the whole of North Canterbury. Do you feel that Canterbury farmers are suffering right now without that water? This area, for sure, has always been a drought stricken area with tremendous potential for horticulture. You can grow damn near anything, but you can't grow it without water. So, on the inside of the head, all these skulls are opening and shutting, and bird song would come out every time the every time the head opened. So um, it was on a you put a, a two dollar coin into the machine, and the head slowly opens, and inside all the skulls are clacking. So it's called bird brain. Nick Smith, who was the minister of conservation then, and who was a national party character, he saw what had happened. Four conservationists had got onto Ecan. 
It wasn't going to work for him. So Nick had them sacked. After he sacked Ike and he put commissioners in there to run the place, and the commissioners were all National Party orientated people. They weren't scientists, they were just people to get a job done. And the job was to take away all the judder bars in the way of development. The Cairn now, it's been what, nine years or so? I can't remember. Since, since 2010. The Cairn is still there on public land, but it's been sanctioned by the fact that so many people wanted it. And we, we wrote on that thing that we would take this cairn down, we would take the boulders from the cairn back to the river that they were, where they were sourced. When we have democracy returned to us, democracy entire. Because you push the edge, you get noticed. But it has to be in such a way that it's not frivolous, if you see what I mean. It's a very, very fine line. So as an artist, that's the best I can do, using visual or oral hyperbole to catch the attention of the public. So all you've got to do is present what they already know, but in a different way, which is, you know, why I made this Nick Smith project. So we're trying to encapsulate what was going wrong with Canterbury. And basically what it was, was one minister shitting in our water. People have said to me, play the game, Sam, not the man. I said, no, no, that's not the way you do it. You play the man. Oh, when we finally presented him outside Ecamp, we did a photo shoot, that was cool. We had a lot of people there, it was lovely. If, if I went over that fine line and people stopped laughing, it would all fire back on us. If you speak to Mike Joy, he will give you the detail of this complex problem. I can't cope with it. I'm an artist. I see things emotionally. When I go to a hearing, people will say, there's no room in this hearing for emotion. You've got to give us facts. You've got to be an expert. You've got to have a degree. Well, I don't, I don't agree. You talk to Mike, you get the logic. You talk to me, you get a, a mishmash of emotions. But both of us are required, I think, to make the change. Please welcome Dr. Mike Joy. I've always thought that the most important thing I can do is to make the public aware that we've got a problem. And I guess I hope I've had some small part in that awareness with the government saying in the last few weeks that 80% of New Zealanders thought that uh, fresh water was our biggest environmental issue. That awareness has pushed the government to doing something about it. The process does eventually work. I just wanted to give a bit of a warning that my name might be Joy, but it should be Dr. Doom. Um, <laughs> just as a, a kind of a, a, an exercise to try and think about how much humans now dominate this planet, just think about two groups of, of the weight of animals on this planet, and it's basically all of the us and the cows and sheep and all the animals that we eat in one hand, and our pets in, in one hand on the balance, and all the wild animals in the world, all the wild mammals for a start. What do you think that balance would be? I've got a little graphic here. It's 98% of the biomass of mammals on this planet is us and the things we eat, and that leaves 2% of the wild for the wild animals. So no wonder we've got a biodiversity crisis. Even if you didn't think about anything else that we do, just think about how much it's about us and so little left for anything else on this planet. That's domesticated livestock and pets up there, then the cattle part of it, and then us as humans, and then the wild animals right down in the corner there. I did a count, and I had done 100 public talks in two years, which is quite a lot, and all over the country as well. Canterbury's got the highest rates of a whole bunch of gastrointestinal diseases of any country in the, in the OECD. We've got the highest rate of Crohn's of anywhere in, in Canterbury. And that's a mycobacterium related thing, which is very similar to the mycobacterium in cows. And it's worst in the rural areas on the, on the shallow bore water supplies. So it's showing up in health. Everything that I say, I back up with, with science and with evidence. I don't go out making claims that I can't justify. So I have all of the evidence that I need to be there, but I'll be seen to be extreme because of the power of the, of the other side of the industry here and all of the resources they have. And I'm just a tell it like it is person and I know how it is. I'm confident about what I say because I've looked very hard before I say it. To, to dilute the amount of nitrate that's lost from farming in Canterbury at present, you would need 25 times more rainfall. So either 25 times less nitrate going out there or 25 times more rainfall to do it. That's why it's the wrong place in New Zealand to be doing this type of farming. Um, and so you can see, here's our good old clean green New Zealand. This, so anything that's orange or red is either moderately or severely polluted. If I overlaid a map of dairy farming in New Zealand, it would just about match up with this. So Southland, Canterbury, you know, those same places are either moderately or severely polluted.
I'm the owner in an equity partnership that's Medbury Farm, Dave Islop. For the last 25 years, all our staff have had t-shirts. In later years, I wanted to put proud to be a dairy farmer on the back, but I actually got vetoed by Brenda, so it's now pride and dairy. My win was the farm sign was proud to be a dairy farm, because yeah, we are proud, proud of what we do, proud to see where the farm's gone. I'd farmed in the centre of Palmerston North, south of Martinborough, and come to Canterbury and had never experienced a sort of an anti-dairying sentiment. And that's changed, that's definitely changed. Three years ago, um, my good mate and equity partner in the farm, Eric, was tragically killed in a mountaineering or tramping accident in the Alps. So to fulfil his want, we'd enter the competition and well, I suppose surprise we won the Canterbury one and run six of the ten awards, I think it was, and was quite stunned really. The technologies that we were taking on was well, knowing what nutrients we were producing, so knowing what we were discharging into the rivers using overseer. Slowly upgrading our irrigation system, going from border dike to pivots where we can, going from the long laterals to post, moving the sprinklers on a GPS to make it sustainable for people doing it. So you see on there, it's got all GPS. Doing a lot of monitoring of what we do. And we've had moisture sensors in for years. They measure the soil moisture so you're not over watering. On a daily basis, we will look on to see what the river is at, so what water we can take, so that's all telemetric. And if we know rain's coming, we'll turn irrigation off, so we're not wasting water. Riverian planting is just on the waterways. 98% of waterways on dairy farms are fenced, so it just stops the sediment. And we started it six, seven years ago because it was good management practice, but also it makes the aesthetics better. Flax, carrots, grass, a bit of toy toys. There's a dairy shed. It must have been built about six or seven years ago. And uh, it's a 54 uh, rotary couch shed. Uh, we milk twice a day. They're pretty keen to get rid of their milk if they're full of milk. And yeah, encouraged to come to the shed. They're pretty quiet. Always trying to analyse forward and back of what's happening and inputs and outputs. But I keep coming back to it, sustainability of people and seeing my people do well around us is really important to me because they are the people that are the practitioners of uh, getting good financial outcomes and getting good environmental outcomes. Irrigation applied effectively, I don't believe it's bad for the waterways at all. If it's too high a stocking rate and poor labour practices, they're not good for the environment. If you haven't got intelligent people that are passionate, you're going to get bad financial and bad environmental outcomes. Science will fix a lot of problems in times. If we need a solution, farmers, the old number eight thing is, we will adapt and find a solution. And farmers don't want to ruin the environment because a stuffed environment or stuffed, stuffed soil structure, one, reduces your profit, and you need profit to do all the things you want to do, and two, you do need to have the public on your side, you know. Hello there. <laughs> wow. Hi. It's impressive. I'm not I was ready for this. Start with this one, but I thought it would scare you. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I don't like that one. Can we turn it off, please? Can we make that one stop? Sorry. Uh, I don't know how to turn it on. There we go. How's the film going? Uh, well, I kind of got to this point where I feel like I got the perspectives of uh, activists to some degree and a lot of farmers, and um, now what I'm looking for is... is uh, uh, the, the Maori perspective. So tomorrow I'm, I'm going to a hui at um, Onuku Marae in uh, Akaroa. Oh, cool. And I'm going to do an interview with uh, the director of the Naitahu Research Center. We'll, we'll see what he has to say on all this. 
it's going to be interesting to hear whether their whole community is really one-sided on this issue or if they're just as split up as everyone else. <laughs> Have you ever been to a Mirai? Yeah, I've been to a couple. How is it? Uh, it's cool. There's a lot of Tikaga that it's important to know before you go. What's that? You have rules, like expectations. Okay, what rules should I not break? <laughs> Don't put your butt anywhere. <laughs> no butt on the no, table. No hats or shoes in the Mirai. Okay. And then have you ever hung at anybody? No. You might want to practice on the mirror. <laughs> hung you myself? Yeah. Okay, well, let's practice right now. You ready? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like you got it. You're at our tenic way. Okay. Well, yeah, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be interesting, and I I have no idea what he's gonna say. So our relationship to the rivers. It's actually a fundamental one written in the Treaty of Waitangi and in the Deeds of Purchase where we were assured of our property rights to the fisheries, but also to our food gathering rights, our food gathering places right throughout. Now, now what's happened over the last 20 years is that the degradation of our fisheries it's multiplied beyond anything we would have imagined in the settlement years in the 90s. A lot of our fisheries are just disappearing. The Crown will say no one owns water, but the legislation has created a property right, like it or not, because we've got people with consents to take water and we know it's over allocated. So Waitangi Day, it is a celebration, commemoration of the day Māori signed the Treaty of Waitangi with the British Crown. We're going to Ōnuku where the Treaty of Waitangi was signed for our tribe. Māori wanted to sign a treaty with the Crown for a whole bunch of reasons. One of them we wanted to trade internationally. I don't think our people saw the empire as a problem. They wanted to be part of it, which is an interesting thing. And that's what it's about. Probably the worst things that have happened is when the settler government came. Following the signing of Te Tiriti o Waitangi, Māori suffered extensive dispossession of land through a series of dishonest transactions and confiscations and through the selective and unfair application of legislation. Waitangi Day is now an opportunity to breathe life into the principles of partnership enshrined in Te Tiriti and to realise the hopes that our ancestors held when they signed Te Tiriti. Hope that iwi Māori will be able to exercise rangatiratanga over our lands to protect our precious resources including fresh water. What's not really appreciated is we've got a whole agricultural economy. White New Zealand goes on about its agricultural economy, but it's pretty much devastated our, our fisheries. We, we actually don't gather foods like we used to because the water is just putrid, it smells. Looking out here is the Acro Harbour. We've fished here all of our lives. We've also been over at Wairewa on the other side and fished for the tuna that you'll see hanging up there. Both lakes 
need to be cleaned up and, and the way the old people have done it is open the lake to the sea and let the salt water flush, flush it out. It's had tuna in there, the best tuna in, in New Zealand, you know. And do you feel like the water quality has changed over the course of your life? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, it's got it's got worse there. Um, I can remember a sw swimming in there. It was clean. It was clear, clean water. And um, but as you get further up around the corner, the quality of the water was quite noticeable. Sort of brownish, you know, browny, greeny colour. And but now, sometimes the, the lake's so bad. It's you can't even go down and, and fish because you can't see any fish because it's it's gone bright green. The purpose of today is it to sort of sort out sort of what everybody's been doing. Yeah. Um, because you've been off doing things, we've been yeah. doing things. Oh, we've just had to meet with our legal advisors on the status of our customary Aboriginal treaty rights to water because they are protected. It's always been a, um, an issue for the tribe who owns the water and it's we've decided we've been watching the situation the water is in a terrible state I think it's fair to say that ECAN and local government authorities have lost the moral status they have no moral authority on this the crown has no moral authority so we'll take the authority on that the judge is going to say or the court's going to say to us um, so what, what's, what have you got in place? How are you going to manage the system? What is your system? Yep. One thing we know, it depends on the hydrology. No one in Canterbury knows what the water capacity is because the system's just like Stone Age technology here. So we want the catchments and everything done because we want to know what the water is. So but at a, just at the stage we're at the moment, we're sort of saying we should own it or control it or regulate it, whatever we're saying. And also we could do a much better job than the current regulators because look, we've invested and here's ideas that and that and they are back in the Stone Age and we're not. We are capable, we're yeah. better prepared. Yeah. And our alternative system is there, yours isn't. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. The technology is already here. Yeah. The idea that possession and ownership and property rights aren't things for indigenous peoples is uh, it really is a white creation. Property rights are fundamental to every group. In every group, there's a mixture of private, personal, communal. Our tribal history is very clear. We have ownership and property rights. It's just, that's the way it is. We've got to get our own act together with our own farming situation. We will be farming on pads and closed. Yeah, so this is a water quality issue. Water quality issue. Because we have to lead by example. Our tribe has farms. We had forestries. We took the trees down. We had to do something with the land. So it was decided to convert it to dairy. The argument was, if we don't do it, someone else will do it. The implication being, from the white management team, that the Chinese will come in and do it. So they played on racism. If we don't do it, those others will do it. And we can do a better job. And I think they've tried to, but I'm not sure it's worked. We have to try harder. And now that we've got them, we have to commit to the obligation to show some leadership on those farms. So they're being examined at the moment. The RMA says it is not real or personal property, so but then it goes on and says you can transfer it and trade it. Banks certainly regard it, the resource consent, as yes. property because that's what right. their security is over. Fundamentally, you can say the local government, the Resource Management Act, has destroyed our fisheries making a kai science. Really, what Simon Upton was looking for was a comp comprehensive piece of legislation that brought order. So I've been to countries without a Resource Management Act, and it's just the wild west of industry. It's just horrid. So you can actually see why it was important because it brings discipline and order. But it never saw what would happen with water. It didn't see the growth of the dairy industry. And it took a fundamental position that we don't have to own water, we can just manage it. But no one cleans a rental. But I want to get into the cultural assumptions about these property rights as well. Because the idea that that bottle is now owned because it's gone through a system. Yeah, so the RMA says once it's in a pipe tangle system, it is, ceases to be water. So that's not water? That is not the water RMA. for the purposes of the RMA. Look, it's interesting. If you were here next year, I think the world would have changed.
with the Naitahu perspective not being exactly what I expected, I still wanted to find ways traditional farmers might start moving towards better practices. I learned there are so many elements to this, but one method in particular stood out to me. Not just for its positive impact on the waterways, but because it can actually be more profitable as well. I'm Tim, Tim Hawke. I'm in a family home, family farm, which is in White Rock. The farm is 222 hectares, and I run predominantly sheep with a few dairy grazers as well. I'm the fourth generation on this property. My great-grandparents arrived here in 1910. They passed it on to my great-uncles and then on to my father and my father passed it on to me. About five years ago, I was looking at my whole farming scene and I was thinking well, it, we should be able to do something differently here. I came across a guy by the name of Rob Flynn from Soil Matters. I used his expertise for a starter, moving away from the acid fertilizers, which is the superphosphates and the ureas, to more organic fertilizers and looking at the biology of the soil more so than just what we need to make the sheep grow. And then EM came onto the scene. We have this business really to promote microbial technology in New Zealand and specifically for us it's the product EM which is an acronym for Effective Microorganisms. EM is a product that's used all around the world so it's a combination of different forms of microbes. So we have bacteria, yeast and fungi in our brew. It's a fermented inoculant so we ferment it here um, in big wine vats and what these microbes do is they work together in the soil to stimulate a biological response. The Japanese professor, Dr. Higa, he was fascinated with microorganisms. He wanted to discover how they influence plant growth. And by chance, he was putting the single strains of microorganisms into a common bucket. And then he noticed where he was discarding his bucket, he got luxury growth. The key to microorganisms is the combinations rather than individuals. I started spraying that onto my pastures. It changed the fungi and the bacteria in the soil so we could utilise the nutrients that we're putting on and they were bound up in the soil and they weren't leaching out the same as what the superphosphates did and the ureas did. And then progressing from there, we developed Bakashi. We're making Bakashi compost here, which is a anaerobic compost mix. So we're using sawdust as carbon that comes from a local sawmill. We're using apples from a juicing factory. I'm putting my dags in, as well as we're putting milk powder in. It's a source of nitrogen. We use the microorganisms to break and mix and feed on what we put in. Compared with traditional composting, the smell is not there. Because of the EM in it, it's feeding the plant straight away as soon as it goes onto the pasture. It's not requiring any more breaking down. And I've noticed too, the soil is more open and there's a lot more worms. And with that, your crops grow well. And then it's carrying on from there. The sheep are doing well and the cattle are doing well on the products as well. I have a network of people around me, Paul Daly, and there's Amy Duckworth from Soil Matters. I value their input into what I'm doing and how I'm doing it, and we're always discussing. I remember when we first had talks about what we were looking to do and achieve, and you knew that it was going to be a gradual process, and mm. there were lots of different things that we looked at. But every year there's been different signs that things have been on the up. The last 18 months have been amazing haven't they yeah and it's been the small things and the big things you know the small things just in the amount of worms that have increased yeah. everywhere yeah, i think resilience is a big one you know yes. coming through resilience for the farm resilience for the animals pastures soils farmer and then again you know all relates back to the environment part of soil matters the cornerstone of our philosophy 
is that we believe that agriculture is a biological system, not a chemical one. Everything that we're doing, we're always trying to, you know, work with Mother Nature. So you figure, you know, someone says organic or biological control, it's so easy to shut that door and just say no, and you know, it's crap, it doesn't work. But what we do is we like to actually trial it. I'll be sending it to Eurofins laboratory today, and it'll probably be about 10 days. Maximum. You're wanting to know what supply available in terms of nutrient. Yeah. Um, and we want to know from the hot water carbon test, you know, how microbial active that carbon is. Yeah, and, exactly. And so what we put into the soil, uh, what sort of payback Tim's going to get, essentially. Yeah. Um, and the estimated nitrogen release, that's that's a really important one for me to know, and the total phosphate as well. Yes. You know, there's millions and millions of dollars each year pumped into research looking at nitrogen and phosphate leaching. But, you know, coming through my degree and looking at all the science behind everything, it, it blows me away because all you've got to do is have an anion exchange capacity test and you can physically see how much phosphate that that soil or anions that that soil can hold on to. So why aren't we basing our recommendations off that? But the answer really is, you know, that simple. It's just being about, you know, more scientific about what you're doing. Today we're opening up the Bakashi heap and we're going to spread it onto a paddock ready to be drilled in Lucerne. We've had the Bakashi tested for nutrients and we've had the soil tested for nutrients and we'll match the two together so we get the best out of what we're putting on to help the Lucerne grow. The people that are saying to put a tonne of superphosphate on aren't wrong. So we've seen that but quite. they're not right, because when you look at the amount that the soil can hold, the conditions, the type of stock that's on it, the crop you're growing, there's all those factors to come into it. Are you prone to leaching, are you not? We've got to get back to the art of farming. Everyone appears to be getting a lot more open-minded about the environment and in the sense that they care about the environment but they're not sure what to do and how to do it. When I open up my Bakashi, um, I have an audience. There's always someone that wants to watch and see how it works and, and have a touch it and smell it and, and, or take some home and put it in their garden. We care about the rivers more than anybody. And it's sort of one of those things, you know, it's, it's quite difficult when a lot of people get very, very um, passionate about their hate towards farmers. Because I don't think it's the farmers' fault at all, you know, they care. I think a lot of the time it's the people behind, you know, it's, it's sales companies and, you know, I think it's really important to look more at the farmers and educate them, yeah, because they do care. Good day out on the farm. From what I'd seen, obviously farmers did care. So who then is to blame? I'd heard time and time again that the culprits were salespeople and the corporate push for more and more product. But was there actually a person? Or a perpetrator? Or does the problem go deeper than that? The economic situation system, I guess, that is in use here and around most of the Western world is destroying the social fabric and destroying the environment. So we need to replace it with something that pays maximum cognizance to the environment and to the social uh, needs of communities and the people, citizens of countries. So that's what we're trying to do tonight, introduce people to a system in which everyone can prosper, everyone can have opportunity, everyone can get education and health, and we can pull back from the destruction of the environment. We know that there's something wrong with the economic system already, 
And this picture up here kind of shows part of the problem. I just started this year talking about donut economics and so teaching people uh, that there are different ways to do economics. So in this course we're going to look at how we can apply these things to a new system that, that we start to think about. The donut in donut economics refers to a diagram to illustrate what we should be aiming our economics towards. These two concentric circles, the inner one being the social foundation, which means that everybody needs to have a certain level of all the obvious things, health, water, housing, education, but also some less obvious things like political voice. And then the outer circle of the donut is the ecological boundaries. We need to provide for everybody so everybody's above the social foundation but within the whole donut so that we don't overshoot the ecological boundaries and that is the safe and just space for humanity to exist. In the 20th century, economics lost its purpose and started chasing the false goal of GDP growth. Simon Kuznets, who created GDP, said it was hardly a good measure of well-being. He had all these caveats around how it should be used. So this is where we are right now. We're in, we're in dire straits in every measure that we can have for the environment or for society. And it's going to crash. And if it crashes, our only salvation is if we have a better system ready to go. Stavely Camp is this cool little place. It is one of the last and largest remaining pieces of forest from here to the sea on all of Canterbury. So it's pretty important to try and look after it. It's pretty much all dairy farm around here. The forest is very under threat from invasive species. So this is like, um, we've got lots of dead trees. This is part of the reason that this forest is so fragile, um, is because it's lost many of the layers that it would have had. And so this is what we're gonna call our forest chapel, which is just a really nice kind of space to kind of, you know, be in nature and, and kind of recognize the sacredness. So in terms of regenerative practices uh, at Stavely, there are lots of plans. What we're doing is making compost bins out of our weed waste. I could even compost some of the animals that I have to trap in here. It's very experimental. It's also quite a permaculture sort of solution. So using the waste to create something else that's then useful um, for other things. There are very clear guides to how you would run regenerative agriculture and it is based in permaculture and it is a set of design principles that take nature as their guide from things like produce no waste, so that's the circular economy, to catch and store energy, to observe and interact with nature, there was a concerted effort by many, many people in the community, including lots of farmers, and people think that there were many more birds this winter. There is hope for building more spaces like this. Many of the farmers around here are putting time and effort and money into regenerating wetlands and pieces of forest. There's a new business starting and we will be hoping to do some economic regenerative practices with that as well. I've been thinking about this and looking at all these animals around here. They know that life wasn't always about fences. And that's just a little analogy that I've been thinking about in terms of us and our economic system. Life can be quite different. We've just got to go back to that place in ourselves that knows where that is.
the collective way forward felt really good in terms of asking for independent information on a number of issues that we're still not sure about and especially the environmental impact of this project. Yet it's a huge aspect of the project, of any project of this nature. So it feels really good to stand here today knowing that I wasn't the only voice asking for, for that line of information. We're of course really disappointed because we won't get any irrigation in the foreseeable future. And there is a possibility, uh, maybe further down the track, but um, we're sort of a bit stuck. But anyway, we just have to keep going like we have been <laughs> for years, I suppose, and do the best that we can do and you know, cope with dries and droughts. The consents to take water, the consents to pollute, are now going to be transferred to another irrigation company who's a bit healthier and they will take their consents to put nitrate in the ground from this project to their project. So when I see this great big tangle, all I want to do is take a sword and cut through it. Environment Canterbury, whom we're still fighting against, they don't like my sculptures, they don't like my artwork. They will do everything they can to stop me putting artworks there. My next project will be to put another artwork there, but in a way they don't expect, in a way they can't stop. That's the job of art, I think, is to prevail anyway. If in the artistic act you can infect the viewer, the observer, with the same passion you felt when you were making the art, then that's art. And then you make a change. Most respectfully yours, Sam Mark. As soon as I get on board this and get some sails up and feel a healing and starting to move through the water and that sound of the water flowing by the hull and then yeah, I'm okay. I've forgotten all the other stuff. I always finish every talk with the quote that um, our rent for living on this planet is to be activists. And I think that's the antidote to depression and feeling bad about this is to actually feel like you're doing something about it. For every reason, the biggest change you can make is to reduce the amount or get rid of animals out of your diet, more so than transport or anything like that. Rivers are easy, you know, rivers because they keep flowing, you know, they'll clean up really quickly, you stop putting stuff into them. I think we really need to look at some catchments and say what is the maximum number of cattle we can have in that catchment. If you don't have a good figure to work off, then you can make big mistakes with modelling and get it all wrong and we've done that so many times. We need more trial farms and farmers need to start thinking about their farms as having an R&D component like any other industry sector. They need to really focus on always improving and, and testing how they can you know, do better environmentally. For me, I feel I'm a steward of the land. It's not all about the value of the land, it's having the privilege to look after my spot. I feel I've got a responsibility to pass it on better than I received it. Our relationship to the land is um, our life, really. Farmers love their farm and their area. We're all wanting to do the best we can. There is financial constraints and time constraints, but gosh, people are moving quickly to rectify things that aren't right. There are some amazing farmers out there and they might just need someone to come in and just educate them a bit more. Yes, it's science but it can be correlated to back being so basic so that anybody can understand it. We look after the good ones and we help the bad ones to be better. Water quality, yes, it is a very big issue, but I think it needs to be dealt with in a very positive way. Farming is New Zealand's identity. I think we just need to be wary of the fact that we can have an impact on the environment and we need to manage that impact to the best of our abilities. If people from town can't go out and swim in the rivers, then that's our fault. We need to make sure that we can do what we can to stop that. But similarly, we lift our game. We would expect that everybody else does the same thing. Regenerative urban landscape would certainly be looking a lot at the way it did transport. What it does with its green spaces, there are ways of producing food in really small spaces, accessing food from closer to home. We are on a planet that is itself a living thing. Everything works together and we don't know at what point the risk to one thing will start to affect something else in ways that we hadn't even imagined.
So, where does that leave us? In summary, it's complicated. I set out on this journey not with an argument to make or a point to prove. I only had questions. Why isn't New Zealand the perfect place I thought it was? What's wrong with the rivers? What's the cause of their pollution? And I wanted to hear more than one side. The stories I found moved me, on every side. As the issues around water continued to multiply, with nitrate in the drinking water posing a cancer threat, and foreign water bottling companies exploiting this natural resource, I wonder about the future of New Zealand and humanity as a whole. They say 99.9% .9 of all the species that have ever lived on the planet have gone extinct. Do we as intelligent human beings have the ability to solve our problems? To fix the things that will lead to the end of us? I believe we do. But it'll take open-mindedness from all of us on a level that most people have never reached, including myself. If this mission has taught me anything though, it's that behind that faceless enemy, there's usually a kind heart. And more to share than I'd ever thought possible. <laughs>